are UMC. Let us join together in the opening reading. Hear these words of Jesus. I give you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. So you must also love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples. When you love each other, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will send another companion who will be with you forever. This companion is the spirit of truth. You know him because he lives with you and will be with you. We join together in Come Now is the Time for Worship. Stand with us. My name is Kathleen McComb, and I am glad to be here, invited to be liturgist at this service by Reverend Jonathan. And we join together as a people of God in worship. So whether you're worshiping with us in person here, in your cars on 88.9 FM, in the parking lot maybe, online, on Facebook, live, or later on YouTube or podcast. You are a part of our family here at TRUMC, and we are so grateful you have joined us on this beautiful Lord's Day. And many of you have already joined together with others in letting folks know that we're worshiping together through the QR code which is like right here. And you can join together with others by filling out your digital connect card. And as far as a welcome this morning, we welcome Reverend McCutcheon back to our sanctuary and pulpit. Edward is the campus pastor for the Furman University Wesley Fellowship and part of the UM College ministry throughout the US that is sponsored by 
our apportionment giving. So we welcome him to our pulpit, and it is great to have that connection with him and with Furman. You'll note in the upcoming events and announcements that you find in your bulletin that there is going to be a blessing of the backpacks on Sunday, August 15th, where we will bless our students, teachers, and all who work in our schools during our 10 a.m. worship service. So please remember to bring your backpacks, your briefcases, your messenger bags, and even totes if you have them. And children's discipleship will resume hopefully on August 22nd. We need additional Sunday school teachers, second persons, and children's church leaders. I am positive that Pastor Christine would be more than happy to hear from you if you would like to add your presence and your gifts to children's discipleship in the near future. And as well, ushers and greeters are needed on Sunday mornings, whereby you can offer a welcome and a bulletin to folks coming to worship with us and to sign up at the beginning of August 22nd. You can contact either Nancy or Marv with the information that is included in our bulletin this morning. And for those of you who might have a small microwave or mini refridge, I think a lot of students have those at Furman. <laughs> um, a small microwave and mini refridge are needed for the nursery room. So if you have one, please contact Pastor Christine. Are there other announcements for this morning? We will continue then with the reading of God's word. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. As I was sitting here and watching folks enter and standing here now, it is amazing how many familiar faces are in the sanctuary to me, and familiar for many, many different reasons. Um, one of you I met years, I was just saying, I met when she was a youth singing, Come is now is the time to worship at the South Carolina Youth Annual Conference. One of you was a former student at Furman Wesley, not while I was there, but welcomed me. Just so many faces, and it is good to be here. It feels like I'm coming home in some ways when I get to come and fellowship with you at Traveler's Rest United Methodist Church. Our scripture reading today comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, beginning uh, with chapter 4 and continuing into chapter 5. Hear now the reading of God's word. So then, putting away falsehood, let us speak the truth to our neighbors for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. Let us stand and sing together amazing love. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, weigh the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I've heard it said, I imagine you have too, the phrase, you don't know what you have until it's gone. Today, I want us to reflect on another idea. The idea that maybe we don't know what we have because we haven't discovered it yet, or we don't know what we have because we have buried it so far underneath all the other stuff. I read a story this week of a, of a man named Ira Yates. I don't imagine you've heard of him unless you just happen to have heard this story. But he lived during the Depression. He lived in Texas. He was fighting to keep his farm. He was fighting to keep his land. He and his family, he worried daily that during these times that they would lose everything that they had built together. One day, a couple of gentlemen came from an oil company and they asked if they could drill a test well on his land, right in the middle of his farmland. He reluctantly agreed, but feeling he had very few options, he said yes. They drilled a test well, struck enough oil to fill 80 barrels a day. Later, it would produce two to three times as much, and 30 years later, still more oil. Mr. Yates was living in the midst of a great wealth and didn't even know it. Now we can debate another time about caring for the earth and drilling for oil and all these things. That's not the point. The point is, how often in our lives are we living in the midst of the greatest wealth and yet we don't even know it? This morning, I want to challenge us not to think about the monetary wealth, but what about the spiritual wealth? What about the possibilities that reside in the midst of us as individuals and in the midst of us as the body of Christ? And I wonder how often we actually are living in a kind of spiritual poverty because we haven't tapped in to the power of the Holy Spirit in our midst. One of the things as pastors we do quite a bit, I spent nine years before coming to Furman as the associate minister. I dealt with youth, I dealt with children, and I taught confirmation class many, many years. And one of the things we talk about in confirmation class and one of the things we talk about in new member classes and one of the things we talk about with, with people who want to join our churches or I talk to students about when they get to Furman and they, they begin to be a part of our ministry is what does it mean to be a member of Christ's holy church? What does it mean to claim God's grace in our lives? What does it mean to be the church? One of the things I like about preaching from Paul's letters is, is in many of the gospel stories, we have to sort of pick ourselves up and we have to put ourselves in to what was going on. And we have to do that also with Paul's letters. But sometimes Paul's letters, we can almost pick them up and read them and feel as if he is writing that letter even to us today, as if he had us in mind when he was writing these letters. And I think this passage that we read this morning is just one of those passages. Paul says, put away falsehood and speak the truth to one another. Speak the truth to one another. Now, this idea of truth is a sticky subject today. It's sticky because I think that oftentimes we seek the truth that already aligns 
with what we believe. We seek the truth that already aligns with what we believe. And so, as we watch our 24-hour news cycle, as we scroll our Facebook feeds, as we have conversations with our friends, and maybe even our not-so-friendly people, we already have our minds made up, and all we're doing is filling ourselves with the truth that already aligns with what we believe. But Paul says, speak the truth. Speak the truth. And so part of claiming this treasure that God has bestowed to each of us means that we have to drill down past the selfishness and the self-interest to seek the truth of God. Paul says, not only speak the truth, Paul says, speak the truth to your neighbor. Now, I find this fascinating. Because as I scroll down my social media news feed, I see a lot of speak, people speaking a lot of truth, but they're speaking the truth to the people who disagree with them. If we read closely the Good Samaritan story, we always like to focus on the three characters at the end. You know, the two religious folks that walked by the man in the ditch and then the Samaritan who stopped. But we don't have to get that far in the story to get to a very interesting fact. In the gospel story, we learn that Jesus is talking to an expert in the law. That is the, that is the person who is dialoguing with Jesus, an expert in the law. And Jesus, he asked Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what do you find in the scripture? Jesus was always good about that, right? You ask a question, he sends you back with, a, with another question. And the, the expert in the law says, well, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Here's the key point. Here's what has always fascinated me in the last few years. It says, the young man looked at Jesus and trying to justify himself, asked the question, who is my neighbor? See, I find that fascinating because this idea that he was trying to justify himself, I read that to say, trying to put his neighbors in a cutesy little box. He would know who was inside. In other words, these are the people I have to love and these are the people that I don't. Because to justify means to align. Now I see it in my own life. It is very, very easy for me to criticize the people with whom I disagree. Or the people with whom I don't really have a relationship But let someone close to me, like really close to me, someone that I know a lot about, let me see something or let them say something, and I'm a lot less hesitant to be critical of them. It's almost like they're within my circle, and when in my circle, I can't really critique the people in my circle. But what I read here is Paul saying, speak truth to your neighbor. Now, just for this moment, because I believe when he says that, he means everybody, because everybody is our neighbor. But I'm going to give you a little grace this morning. And maybe not so much grace, considering this is the hardest part. And I'm going to say, even if we took a narrow view of neighbor, isn't it that those are the hardest people to speak the truth to? Aren't those the hardest people to be real with? We just don't want to do it. It's just so hard. But we're called as a church to put away our falsehood, to drill down past our self-serving interest and speak the truth of God. 
Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not allow the sun to go down on your anger. Did Paul say, don't get angry? No. How many of you this morning are angry about something? And I don't, maybe, maybe not in the sanctuary, not right now, right in this very moment. But I mean, if you thought about your past week, how many of you got really angry about something? Or how many of you just find yourself in this state of anger? Maybe you're angry at COVID. Maybe you're angry because now you have to wear masks. Maybe you're angry at the people who are vaccinated. Maybe you're angry at the people who aren't vaccinated. Maybe you're angry at this one specific news network. Maybe you're angry at this other specific news network. Maybe you're angry at this one political party. Maybe you're angry at this other political party. You get my point? There is a lot that we get angry about. And there is a lot that we get angry about that we should be angry about. Jesus got angry. Jesus was angry when he showed up at his father's house, when he showed up at the temple. And here's all these people making money left and right, selling the sacrifices. Jesus got so angry, he turned the tables over. I do a retreat sometimes with my students when we... Um, some of them said they might be here. I don't, I don't see them. If they're here, they're just going to get a little preview maybe of a retreat that might be coming up. But when a retreat, especially in the spring, aligns around the week of Holy Week, I do a retreat sometimes where throughout the weekend, we actually walk with Jesus on that last week of his life. And so our first lesson is about him coming into uh, Jerusalem on the you know, Palm Sunday. But one of those is when he shows up at the temple and he turns the table over. Tony, I don't know. You might have been on a retreat with us when I did this. But we rented a house on one of the lakes, Kiwis or Hartwell. I can't remember. And nobody knew this. But I had taken money and all kinds of things and put it on a coffee table. And, and part of my lesson was to open it up by, by telling them they, we were going to start at 930 knowing we weren't going to start at 9.30 because we don't ever start anything on time at Wesley or on a retreat. Anyway, they showed up a few minutes late and I acted like I was angry. I turned the coffee table over and I broke all the coasters that were sitting on the coffee table. You got to be careful about your illustrations out there because you ain't messed something up. But Jesus got angry. Jesus also got angry when he witnessed that there were people who needed healing but the religious leader says, you can't heal today. See, today is the Sabbath, and you can't heal on the Sabbath because we don't work on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, that is crazy. You mean your religious laws mean that someone else has to suffer an extra day because I can't heal them today? Jesus said, absolutely not. Jesus got angry. But what Paul is saying here is, Allow that anger, allow yourself to use that anger in a way that makes the world better. I feel it in my own soul. I was just talking to my mom this week about a thing called compassion fatigue. Maybe you have heard that phrase. Maybe you've experienced that. Basically, it's just we've been living in the midst of this COVID so long that we, we just, our, our ability to be compassionate toward other people is just waning. And that is not good if you're a pastor. That's like an occupational hazard. Someone calls you and tells you they've got something going on, and you're like, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, you, you, Rhonda, don't tell Jim I said that. You just, that's, but we feel it. And you know what? I think that comes some from the fact that we are perpetually walking around angry and angry at things that we really probably can't change. And Paul says, use that anger to bring good, but don't use that anger and let it fester and let it grow and let it overtake you to the point that now you're just completely tearing down the body of Christ. 
Paul says, do not steal. Do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Do not act in bitterness. Do not act in rage. Do not act in anger. Rather, in this passage, he says, work, work, work doing useful deeds so that we may have something to share with others. Speak what is helpful for building up. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as Christ has forgiven you. In my first appointment down in Casey West Columbia, I came up with this phrase that I used to tell my youth all the time. And it was this, that which is not building up is tearing down. I never knew where I got that from, but I'm, a, I'm beginning to think I got it from right here. That which is not building up is tearing down. And over the years, I've had very bright students, many of them at Furman, say, well, that's not actually true. It's not one or the other. And I would always say, technically, you may be right. But I tell you what, just for a moment, let's just assume that that is true. You're either building up or you're tearing down. Make sure whatever you're doing, whatever you're saying, how you're treating people, what you're posting, what you're filling yourself with, make sure it's filling you up or building you up and building up other people. Because to do otherwise, to do neutral, might just be perpetuating harm in another place. That which is not building up is tearing down. And Paul says, be imitators of God. Be imitators of God. What do you think of? Who do you think of when you think of God? I think of love. I think of grace. I think of mercy. I think of me on my brattiest and worst days ever. And I think of my mom saying, it's okay. I think of my wife loving me anyway. I think of my dad standing with me. I think these are the people, my grandparents. What does it mean to be an imitator of God? What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? What does it mean to be a part of the body of Christ? What it means is like Mr. Yates, we are living with the greatest treasure ever. And oftentimes, we live like we don't even know it's there. All we need, all we need is within us. We just have to be brave enough, courageous enough to follow Christ's example. We just have to be willing to drill down past our selfish ambitions, our petty arguments, and seek this treasure that is within us. And I get it. Life is hard. This past year and a half is hard. And life just keeps layering upon layering upon layering and just putting more stuff on us. More stuff, more stuff, more stuff. And we feel the weight. But don't ever forget that below it all, below all of that, is the word of God to each of us. And it's the same word that shows up early in the scriptures, that showed up in Jesus' own life. Son, daughter, you are beloved. And with you, I am well pleased. Let us pray. Almighty God, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for the gentle and not so gentle reminders of the life that we are called to lead. But we are also thankful that even though you put before us a daunting task, 
to bring about love and hope and grace and mercy into this world of ours. Even though the task is daunting, you have bestowed within each of us the greatest treasure. Allow us to seek that treasure and also to live as those who are aware that it is there. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now please pray with me in these words adapted from a prayer by Eric Tonjes. Come, Holy Spirit, breath of God, your spirit breathed into us and made us alive and makes us alive here and now. Creative spirit, you are the agent of our recreation always. When you are far, when you are near, and when we are far, you seek us and work wondrous new birth in our hearts. You are the tether by which God binds our hearts to the heart of God. You are ever the means through which we experience union with Christ. You are the seal of assurance that reminds us when we are afflicted and uncertain that we are in truth children of God. Holy Spirit, you are at work in us to call us right now to be holy ones, to do all that is pleasing to God. May we be attentive to you working within us. Convict us of our compromises with the world. Teach us to love others, to rejoice, to live at peace, to forgive, to show mercy. You nudge us to be kind, to seek others good above our own, to be faithful, gentle, exercising self-control. And most gracious spirit, you are the one who gives us good gifts with which to build up Christ's body. Help us to recognize the talents and abilities you have given to each one of us. Help us to recognize in us and them gifted quality. And Holy Comforter, as you work in us, so work through us to bring healing and good news to the world around us. Make us agents of God's peace, seeking to mend what is broken by missing the mark. And dear gentle spirit, you are the Comforter, God drawn near and in us. We especially remember those who are heavy hearted, who are experiencing grief, who are affected by lives torn apart by all that is going on in the world. Be to them a balm, a spring of strength, and a hopeful promise of the glory that awaits those who you have joined to Jesus Christ, even here and now. And we pray all of these things in the name of the one who calls us beloved always and taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is your time to respond to the wonderful sermon we just heard, so let's see how you can sing it out this morning. Please stand with us. Please stand.
in which you give to the church and the mission and ministry of the church, you are welcome to find a um, offering basket as you leave. And also there are ways to give online and we appreciate each and every one of you who continues to give time, talent, energy, wisdom to our church family. And now we have the going forth of the doxology to praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. may we go forth being reminded 
that within each of us is the great treasure, being reminded that we are beloved. So let us go forth in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.